for the last couple of years, I've been waking up almost every day to either hear the word climate change or read about it in one of the newspapers. I'm sure all of you must have faced a similar situation. Many of us are quite aware of what the problem is and we very casually feel that it's the government that needs to do something about it. Either the Conference of Parties or the United Nations or our own government. However, we will take a look at how we, you and I, can contribute to the mitigation of climate change. What you see on the screen right now are two pictures next to each other. One is a mobile phone and the other is that of a tree. If I were to ask anyone in this room or anybody in the world, which of these would be a more powerful tool to fight climate change? I'm sure without any hesitation, the answer would be the tree and not the mobile phone. And yet, and yet, every year we are making 1.5 billion mobile phones and we are taking away 10 million hectares of forests every year. This is every year. So, common sense tells us that we need to plant more trees, we need to conserve our ecosystems, and we need to fight this common enemy, which is the climate change. But every single person on this photograph knows this issue. And yet, and yet, we cut down forests and we make new stuff. We make more mobile phones, we make faster cars, we make power hungry appliances. We are doing everything which is taking us against climate change. Why are we not planting more trees? What's, what's the problem with that? Which brings us to the question that we start with today. What is it that drives a sustainable behavior within each of us? Is there something which makes us do these actions when we don't want to do them? Let's examine this. And with an understanding of what is driving unsustainable behavior, we will probably get to understand how you and I, the we of the people, will be able to fight climate change. For that, we need to understand how the economy is structured. On one side, we have households where people like you and me live. And on the other side are the industries which work for us. The industry makes products which you and I go out and buy. We need goods, we need tables, we need chairs, we need watches, we need clothes. All of that is made in the industry and we are the people who are going to buy those stuff. So the flow of goods from the industries to the households is as depicted by the yellow arrow. On the other side, you have the flow of services, which means people like you and me go out and work in the industries. We provide our labor, we provide our intellectual knowledge, we provide the, 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 the labor which is required to run these factories. So the yellow arrows show how the flow of goods and services happen in the economy. Exactly opposite of that is the flow of money. Because we buy products from the industries, we have to pay them money. And the white arrow on the top of the screen shows how the money goes from households to the industries. At the bottom, it's the industries which pay us because we go out and work for them. So here the white arrows will depict the flow of the money and the yellow arrows will depict the flow of the goods and services. Now, for a well-oiled, well-lubricated economy, there needs to be some infrastructure. And that's what when the government comes in. So the government collects taxes for sale of goods, for sale of services, income tax, corporate tax, all what have you. And the, 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 with the taxes together, the government is going to put up the infrastructure which is required for the economy to be well lubricated and running on its own. So the government makes airports, seaports, railways, roads. It gives us the judicial system. It gives us police. It gives us all the wherewithal which is required so that the economy is not hampered in any way. And the efficiency of the economy is measured by GDP, GNP, GNV, all those terms which you keep hearing and again reading about in newspapers every day. Simply said, the sum of all the white arrows and making a few deductions would give you, broadly, would give you the gross domestic product of the nation. Open any newspaper, watch any channel, 
there is some news item about how, which way the GDP of India is going. Are we climbing up? Are we competing with China? Is America going ahead of us? So on and so forth. We keep hearing this very much. We are a nation fixated by the growth of GDP. The economic engine doesn't stop here. There are two very important things which are very closely connected with the economy, which we seem to overlook in day-to-day -day life. The first one of this is that the foundation of the economy comes from a steady, sustainable supply of natural resources. Look around you. In front of me, I have a table. The timber is coming from a forest. I'm holding a remote in my hand. It's made of plastic. The plastic is made from crude oil. There is a tile which I'm standing on. It's made of silica. That's coming from nature. Each and everything which you see is manufactured with the help of a raw material which comes from nature. We need land to create a factory. We need fossil fuels. We need coal to generate electricity. We need water. We need gases. We need people. All of that is from nature. And that is why it is called as natural capital. Natural capital is the foundation of the economy. So you probably have caught on to what I wish to say in this slide. When we are fixated about a growing GDP, we forget the fact that we are implying that the resource stock, the non-renewable resource stock is going to deplete as the GDP goes up. That's also not the full story. The other part of the story is that we are generating a lot of pollution when we are producing things which are going to grow the economy. Remember, there is no pollution in nature. The detritus of one species is food for the another. The food chain, the food web, the entire ecosystem recycling is working so that not a single substance in the entire nature is going to pollute or hamper the efficiency of the ecosystem. And yet, anything which we make in the factory, a man-made molecule, a man-made substance, Nature does not know how to recycle. It doesn't know how to decompose it. And that is going to end up as pollution. So anything which is made here or consumed in our household is going to pollute. So on one hand, the non-renewable resources for which we have a limited stock are going to be depleted as we are pushing up the GDP growth. And on the other hand, the, no the renewable resources which are air, water, and soil are going to be polluted as we are going to push up the GDP. So, what, what is the implication about these two things in nature being affected by the economic growth? We have seen a loss of forests. Mining industry, which is again one of the foundations of the economy, has been one of the biggest deforestation drivers in the entire world. Agriculture, which is also an economic activity, has been a huge driver of deforestation. Dairy farming, species extinction, as forests are lost, habitats are lost. Habitats are lost, then but you, the community populations change. As community populations change, the food web is broken down. And as food webs break down, it is driving several species to extinction. There are the, that degrades ecosystem productivity, natural ecosystem, a riverine ecosystem, an aquatic ecosystem, a mountain ecosystem, a grassland ecosystem. Each one of them is not going to function as to its full efficiency if there is species extinction, if there is degradation, if there is pollution. It doesn't work. We are creating huge ozone holes with the pollution that we have created. The greenhouse gases are opening up the ozone holes. There are new diseases. Look at the last two decades. MERS, SARS, Nipah, Zika, coronavirus. All of them have jumped from the animal kingdom into the human kingdom. Th there are two major reasons why this is happening. Habitat loss for those viruses and breakage of the food chain. And that is why they are jumping into the human kingdom. And finally, the granddaddy of all externalities, which is climate change. So why is it that we are overlooking the depletion of natural resources? 
Why is it that the pollution is unabated in the economy? We know these problems, right? Economists have been talking of these problems for ages, right? From Adam Smith to even modern day economists. Everybody knows these problems. It has got something to do with two things. One is the pricing mechanism which we use in the economy. And second is the way the free markets are structured. Let's look at both of them. Look at the, let's look at the pricing mechanism. In this economic engine, we have four major categories of inputs which we take from nature. The first is the non-renewable resources. The second would be the renewable resources. The third is global public goods, which is oceans, air, atmosphere, and the gases. And finally, ecosystem services. The first two are the inputs to the economy. They are the ones on which we build up, make our products. We build our services and we create the currency which is required from that. And the second two are the planet's life sustaining services. These two are helping us survive. These two are helping us to go out and work and create the products from the natural resources. It's about the way we are pricing natural resources, which seems to be a huge problem in the economy. Let's look at how we price these. If you ask an economist, he will say that these non-renewable and renewable resources are priced on the extrinsic value. What is an extrinsic value? Extrinsic value is the market value of that product. And how does the market allot a value to a natural resource? In two ways. One is based on the demand and supply and second is based on the scarcity value. Air is not at all scarce. There is a huge demand for air, but it is not scarce in supply. So nobody is going to pay money for taking in air. How, however, nowadays after COVID, we have seen people buy oxygen. So this iron ore, if the price of steel rises from 10,000 rupees to 11,000 rupees, you can rest assured that there are two things happening in the economy. One is that the demand is going up or second, that the production is diminishing. If either one of this happens, the price goes up. And that's what is called as extrinsic value. On the other hand, the global public goods and the ecosystem services are priced on its intrinsic value. The value of the resource being there in nature. What is the value of this river flowing unabated in the pristine way that you see in this photograph? What is the value of the iron ore being in Molem Wildlife Sanctuary in Goa? That value cannot be captured in a market economy. We have never considered that value. And it is because we don't consider that value of the natural resource, we tend to use it very frivolously in the economy. The economy produces what is demanded, right? And obviously the demand is more for mobile phones than for trees in the marketplace. And the economy doesn't care how it is produced. Let me give you an example. This can of cola, which you and I have probably bought so many times before. How is it made? It's very easily picked up from the shelf, picked up. We pay 20, 30 bucks for it and gulp it down. Let's look at the manufacturing story. The aluminum comes from Odisha. The aluminum processing is done in Haryana. The can is produced in Aurangabad in Maharashtra. The ink is coming from Gujarat. The cola powder is probably coming from United States of America. The sugar is coming from Uttar Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, what have you. The water is coming to the sugarcane fields from the dams of various rivers across the country. Packaging is done in Pune and it, electricity is coming from the grid and it is sold in 28 states and 8 union territories. It's far more intensely resource consumptive to make this can of cola than to consume it. We pay 20 bucks and it has obscured all these costs which is there. And all this has left a trail of resource depletion and pollution in its wake all across the globe. Not just in the place where it is being consumed, but all across the globe. So let's also look at the energy use in the economy. Immediately after the Industrial Revolution, if you would have plotted the way energy was consumed, electricity was consumed by a normal average human being, you would have seen a large part of it was consumed for livelihood, for heating, for cooling, for electrical appliances, for traveling, for you know doing all the stuff which is required to earn us money. A smaller portion can be attributed to comfort and convenience. And the smallest portion would be attributed to entertainment. That was during the period of the Industrial Revolution. If you plot the same pie chart today, you'll be surprised that livelihoods have shrunk. 
we don't need as much energy for livelihoods as we used to need relatively we use a phenomenal amount for comfort and convenience and we are growing our use for entertainment look around you there's entertainment all over a lot of energy and electricity is guzzled in these places so that is what is making up the economy today let's now move to the solutions part of it what must the governments do there are a couple of things which the governments do which you and i cannot do first is carbon accounting sequestration capacity accounting many governments have started doing that the indian government has also started initiatives which are talking about carbon accounting circular economy we should have more green economic zones we have special economic zones can we make green economic zones which have circular economies can we revitalize agriculture to reduce the carbon and water footprints certainly we can do that can we move away from gdp as a measure of growth to well being and social development as a measure of how the economy is performing can we make science and technology help us to adapt and mitigate the problem can we have a low carbon growth can we promote green entrepreneurship these are the things which government can do but more importantly there are some things which we can do can i contribute to my uh, uh, mitigation certainly i can can i calculate my water footprint yes i can do that can we reduce it yes if i start measuring my carbon footprint i can reduce my carbon footprint what do you eat where does it come from what is its ecological footprint can i figure that out it is possible with modern day technology can i calculate my water footprint yes indeed there are calculators which are available online where you can calculate the foot water footprint of your lifestyle commuting and travel can you use non motorized transport there are many forms of public transport there are many walkways and cycling paths these days which are coming up in cities how much do you really need can you use the product to the end of its life or do you want to change your mobile phone every 3 months not required and lastly contribute to conservation contribute to ecology plant a tree make a butterfly garden keep a beehive there are so many things which you can i do the pathway from here to here is not easy it requires a huge change in the attitudes that we are displaying a huge change in the behaviors but it is possible thank you